Behind the Line Extra for your Saturday, February 1st, 2020. I'm your host, KC. Follow me on Twitter at KC underscore BTL84. Like and subscribe on YouTube. Leave a five-star rating on iTunes. I appreciate your support. If you haven't seen the 30 for 30 on Michael Vick yet, I highly recommend you go check it out. I'm sure ESPN will replay it. You can catch it on ESPN+. Plus. It's part one of a two-part series aired Thursday night. The second one's airing this coming up Thursday. We really forget how Michael Vick revolutionized the NFL. He doesn't get the credit he deserves because of the whole dogfighting scandal. But before Michael Vick, you didn't have mobile quarterbacks in the NFL. You had your black quarterbacks before, your Warren Moons, your Doug Williams, but they were more or less pocket passers. When Michael Vick came into the NFL, nobody had seen anything like it. Defenses didn't know how to defend him because before Michael Vick, Quarterbacks weren't running run-pass options. Quarterbacks weren't breaking out of the pocket when nobody was open downfield and running for 50 yards. Michael Vick paved the way for guys like Russell Wilson, Lamar Jackson. You didn't have quarterbacks like that in the National Football League before Michael Vick came out of Virginia Tech. I don't feel like Michael Vick gets the credit he deserves for changing the game of football. I think he's eligible for the Hall of Fame after next season. Be interesting to see how the NFL handles that. I believe he should be a first ballot Hall of Famer. But we'll see what happens. Super Bowl week is always an interesting week. The trash talk, the players on the 30 other teams not playing in the game, making their media rounds, speculation about what's going to happen in the offseason. Most of the stories that come out of Super Bowl week have very little to do with the game itself. And the biggest story this week, in my opinion, coming out is the future of several high-profile quarterbacks. Tom Brady posted a cryptic tweet on Twitter and Instagram. It was black and white. Showed him walking out of Gillette Stadium. Of course, everyone is speculating as to the meaning. My stance on Brady hasn't changed. He's played his final game in New England and will be playing elsewhere next season. I don't care what the experts and the executives say about it. They're all predicting a return to New England. I don't see it happening. Tom Brady has never done anything like this. Going to social media to express his feelings. Obviously, he's bothered by how he's been treated by Bill Belichick. I compare NFL coach and quarterback situations all the time to a marriage. This marriage between Brady and Belichick is in the middle stages of a divorce. Bill Belichick's the initiator. He's over Tom Brady. Inexplicably, the greatest quarterback of all time is the jilted party in this failing marriage. He feels disrespected, doesn't feel loved, so to speak, and and rightfully so. Like I've said before on this podcast, the New England Patriots were irrelevant before Tom Brady. Bill Belichick was a no-name failing coach when he was hired by New England. There wasn't a lot of media coverage. There wasn't a lot of pomp and circumstance behind his hire. Tom Brady made this franchise the best in professional sports. And now they want to divorce him. There's also whispers going around about the potential retirement of Drew Brees. I saw, I think it was Adam Schefter yesterday, talk about how Brees is strongly considering retirement. And that hasn't been the case the past couple of years. But I don't believe any of those reports either. I think Breeze will be back in the Saints uniform next season. The Saints are in the midst of the best three-year run since Drew Brees and Sean Payton arrived back in 2006. I think 2020 will be his last season. What I can see happening is he's going to return next year not only to contend for the Super Bowl, but also to continue to develop Taysom Hill to be a successor. Breeze and Hill are close friends. And let's be honest, Taysom Hill's not quite ready to be the starting quarterback. Not to mention the fact that the defense in New Orleans is aging. And next season will likely be their final shot at a Super Bowl for a couple of years while they go into rebuild. Of course, 
if this were to happen, this means the Saints would have to wave bye-bye to Teddy Bridgewater. With their cap situation, no way they can hang on to all three quarterbacks, especially with Bridgewater expected to receive a significant pay raise based off his 5-0 and performance and Drew Brees' absence. They can retain Taysom Hill much cheaper. I think Hill is a product of Sean Payton. He's a system quarterback. It's in his best interest to remain in New Orleans. I think Taysom Hill needs Sean Payton, Drew Brees, and the Saints more than they need him. Then we've got Cam Newton. In my eyes, all signs point to Cam Newton and the Panthers parting ways. You don't usually see teams hire a rookie head coach and hang on to the veteran quarterback. Carolina's already parted ways with veteran tight end Greg Olson. They're going into a full rebuild. Can't do that with Cam Newton under center, who at this point of his career is in win-now mode. He needs to be on a contender. Not to mention the fact that Cam Newton needs a fresh start. The $19.1 million salary cap savings that Carolina would get by trading him is going to be enticing for them to pass up. If I'm Matt Nagy and the Chicago Bears, I'm getting on the phone and doing everything I can to get Cam in Chicago. We also will see this offseason what the Titans decide to do with Ryan Tannehill. Like I mentioned with Taysom Hill, Ryan Tannehill is a system quarterback. He benefited by the scheme the Titans ran and the fact that he had the best running back in the NFL in his backfield. But I don't see Tennessee offering a big money long-term contract to Ryan Tannehill. Not at this point. They needed him to step up One game this postseason, the AFC Championship game in Kansas City. Derrick Henry and the defense carried the Titans the first two games. Tennessee needed Ryan Tannehill to step up just one time, and he shit the bed. Played himself out of a long-term contract. Now, I don't think the Titans are going to just let him walk. I mean, he had a good season. He was one of the reasons they were able to turn things around. Probably saved Mike Vrabel's job. The problem with Tannehill, everything around him has to be perfect for him to succeed. Six years in Miami, zero playoff appearances, only one season with a winning record. This season was a perfect storm for him in Tennessee, which is why I predicted before the season started that he would step in and save the season. Great defense, elite running back. All they needed from Ryan Tannehill was to step in and manage the game. Don't take risk. Limit the turnovers. Take care of the ball. And that's exactly what he did. I think he'll be franchise tag. Not only to see if he can improve on the 2019 season, but more importantly, to see what Derrick Henry will look like next season. Will he be as productive? Or will he begin to decline? And if he does decline, will Ryan Tannehill be able to step up and lead the way? If he can then you commit big money to him. But he's got to prove that first. All right, moving on. People always say that women mature faster than men. And it's true. I don't think guys really experience mental maturity until they reach about 25 years old. I know for me, the decisions I was making at 19, 20, 21, I'd never make those same decisions at 25, 28, 30 years old. When we men are young, we're quick-tempered, quick to fly off at the mouth. We rarely think before we speak. Baker Mayfield will be 25 years old in a couple of months. And it seems like his maturity level is beginning to rise with his age. I was a huge critic of Baker Mayfield throughout the regular season. It seemed like every week he was giving us plenty of material to talk about. None of it good. But I heard something from Baker Mayfield Friday morning that I haven't heard in his entire NFL career. I saw a humble Baker Mayfield. I saw a man admitting his mistakes. A 6-10 and season being last in the league in touchdown-to-interception ratio has a tendency to humble you. He was on ESPN's Get Up yesterday morning, sitting across the table from Rex Ryan. Rex Ryan was critical of Baker Mayfield earlier in the season, said he was overrated after the Browns' Week 3 loss to the Rams. Listen to what Baker Mayfield had to say in terms of responding to his critics. Quote, it comes back on doing my job the best I can, not worrying about the outside stuff, not replying to you. He's referencing Rex Ryan there. 
Just doing my job and doing what really matters being a quarterback, end quote. That's exactly what I want to hear out of a franchise quarterback. That's what we've been looking for out of Baker Mayfield for two years. Past couple of years, he's made the type of mistakes that we all make as dudes when we're young. Colin Cowherd criticized him. Baker Mayfield lashes out at him. Rex Ryan says he's overrated. Mayfield strikes back. Drew Brees has been criticized the past couple of years for falling off late in the season, for losing his ability to throw the deep ball. Lamar Jackson's been criticized for not being a great pocket passer, for being a run-first quarterback. Those guys never respond to the criticism. Why? Because at the end of the day, the critics don't win football games. I was impressed with Baker Mayfield Friday. He was on ESPN. He was on Fox. They were peppering him with some pretty tough questions, and he handled it like a franchise quarterback. I could see the Browns having a bounce-back season next year. I think Baker Mayfield, now that he's been humbled, now that he appears to be maturing, is going to improve his game this offseason. Instead of using his time to film commercials, I think he'll be using his time to improve, start leading by example. I think part of the reason he and the Browns struggled so much last season was because he allowed outside influences to affect him. The team is going to take on the personality of their quarterback. Baker Mayfield was constantly aggravated, constantly angry. The team followed suit. He was constantly lashing out at the media. The team followed suit. And Freddie Kitchens was not the head coach that was going to stop that from happening. Another young quarterback who had some interesting comments this week was Joe Burrow. Former LSU quarterback expected to be the top pick in the NFL draft was on the Dan Patrick Show Friday morning. And this is what he had to say about being the number one pick. Quote, you want to go number one, but you also want to go to a great organization that's committed to winning Super Bowls. If I'm Joe Burrow, I'm pulling an Eli Manning and coming out publicly, refusing to sign with the Cincinnati Bungles. The Bungles are a joke, an embarrassment to the NFL. I know that last time I said this, I ruffled some feathers. Some of you Bungles fans got pissed off, but it's the truth. Listen to what Joe Burrow said. He wants to go to an organization that's committed to winning. That damn sure isn't the Bungles. The reason Carson Palmer left in 2011 was because he felt like the franchise wasn't committed to winning. So if you're a young quarterback like Joe Burrow coming off a perfect season at LSU, won a national championship, haven't experienced a loss in close to two years, then why the fuck would you want to start your NFL career where careers go to die? But KC, if he drops in the draft, he'll lose a lot of money. Not really. The difference in pay isn't that big from number one to number five. Around five or six million dollars. He can make that up easily with endorsements. After the Bungles, next up is the Redskins, Lions, and Giants. All three teams already have their quarterback. Maybe the Redskins would draft him, even though they're trying to develop Dwayne Haskins. But after that, the next two teams could be a good fit for Joe Burrow. Dolphins and Chargers both have better coaching staffs, better rosters, better ownership. Honestly, any team in the league would be better to start your career than the fucking Bungles. All right, let's get to my Super Bowl pick. Chiefs at Niners, current line is Kansas City minus one. This line actually opened Kansas City minus one and a half. I couldn't believe it. Although the Chiefs have the better skilled players, I feel like San Francisco is a far better team. Everyone is critical of Jimmy Garoppolo. I don't understand why. I wasn't a believer early in the season, but he convinced me the last eight games that he's legit. The 49ers are battle-tested. They've beaten the best teams in the league all season. Road game at New Orleans, no problem. Jimmy G put the team on his shoulders, carried them to a win. Road game at Seattle to determine the number one seed in the NFC, no problem. Kansas City, on the other hand, hasn't really been tested. Patrick Mahomes missed a few weeks in the regular season. Their best win of the season was at New England. And we all know the Patriots just weren't that good this year. 
Their road in the postseason was made easier with early exits from New England and Baltimore. Chiefs were down 24 to nothing at home to the miserable Texans. The Chiefs haven't faced a defense like San Francisco all year. I said it the other day on this podcast. The Chiefs have to have a near perfect game from Patrick Mahomes to win. The 49ers can beat you in multiple ways. Jimmy G was hardly used in the NFC Championship game. Green Bay knew coming in the Niners were going to run it down their throat and they couldn't stop them. Kansas City has one of the worst run defenses in the league. Ranked 26 against the run. Not hard to determine what Kyle Shanahan's game plan is going to be. The saying defense wins championships isn't a cliche. It's a fact. Six of the last seven Super Bowls, better defense has won. The only concern I have with the Niners, they've struggled this season against mobile quarterbacks. Struggled against Lamar Jackson, Russell Wilson, Kyler Murray. I think Andy Reid will exploit this weakness in their defense. I just don't think it's going to be enough. I know everyone is picking the Chiefs to win. All the more reason I'm going the other way. Anytime I see the betting public, and especially the mainstream sports media, load up on a team like this, it's always smart to bet the opposite direction. Even if that wasn't the case, and I'm just judging this game on paper, I only see one way Kansas City can win, while the 49ers can win in multiple ways. San Francisco has the better offensive line, better front seven, better secondary. I hate to say it, because I'm not a fan of the 49ers. They used to be one of the Saints' biggest rivals when they both played in the NFC West. But I like San Francisco to win the Super Bowl, taking San Francisco plus one. All right, that's all for today. I'll be back Tuesday to recap the weekend. I'll be tweeting about the Super Bowl Sunday night. You can follow me on Twitter at KC underscore BTL84. Enjoy the Super Bowl. Enjoy your weekend. I will see you on Tuesday.